Welcome to another episode of Tank Talks, your personal think tank for all things startups and venture capital. I'm your host, Matt Cohen, founder and managing partner at Ripple Ventures. On today's show, we welcome head of risk at Tola, Evan Dreyer, to share how to understand risk management as a startup. Evan shares how his journey into the capital markets world working at Credit Suisse during the global financial crisis shaped his views on risk management. We dig into the lessons he learned from history and how founders should think about risk during their startup journey. We spend time discussing how the lack of risk management at bankrupt crypto exchange FTX is not something startup founders should just ignore, and some suggestions on what founders can actually do to avoid becoming the next FTX. Lastly, we discuss how Evan assesses risk as an angel investor and how others should be thinking about risk as investors in these current markets. But before we get started today, as our listeners probably know by now, the team at Ripple is always focused on helping our founders and portfolio companies find the best partners to work with. And when it comes to corporate finance and cash management, there's nobody we recommend more than the team at Jeeves. At Ripple, we manage all our fund expenses and employee credit cards using Jeeves. The team at Jeeves helped me get my team set up with physical and virtual cards in days. I was able to allow my teammates to expense items in multiple currencies, allowing them to pay for anything, anywhere, at any time. We weren't asked for any personal guarantees or to pay any setup or monthly SaaS fees. Not only does Jeeves save us time, but they also give us up to 3% cash back on our purchases, including expenses like Google, Facebook, or AWS every month. The best part is Jeeves puts up the cash and you settle once every 30 days in any currency you want, unlike some other corporate card companies that make you prepay every month. Listeners of Tank Talks can get set up today with a demo of Jeeves and take advantage of our Tank Talks special with a $250 signup bonus and skip the waitlist that already has thousands of companies waiting on it by visiting tryjeeves.com backslash Tank Talks. Use referral code Tank Talks to get set up today. Now let's jump into the tank for this week's episode with Evan Dreyer from Tola. Thanks for joining us in the tank today, Evan. Thanks, Matt. Honored to be here. You know, Evan, your timing for joining us in the tank today as a risk expert, given everything that's going on in the markets these days, is super important. Given everything with the FTX and the Twitter shit show, it's taken over social media. But before we dive right in, it would be great if you can give our audience some background on how you got started in the risk management space and your overall investing journey. Absolutely, Matt. So I took a unique path to risk management because I started my career in investment banking, specifically on the capital market side of the business in 2010 at Credit Suisse. It was a really unique time for the markets because they were coming out of the crisis. And really what was happening in the overall landscape was was transforming in real time. So it was awesome to kind of start my career at a very dynamic time for markets. I really let that dynamic, what's happening and following that guide my career. I moved from there to our M&A group at a time when we were rolling out a new contested situations team. So that shareholder activism, hostile takeover defense, uh, something that had really kind of come up as, as, as investors and hedge funds were thinking about the future market and, and what this new world meant. Um, and for me, that, that opportunity was fantastic to kind of work on you know, high profile stuff. I got to be a part of the, the Dell LBO and defending that from Paul Icon. So it really was this unique time, not only for our firm, but for, for finance in general. And, and at that point, I got an opportunity to move into internal strategy because we had had some success in building out that, that M&A team. And at that time, in the kind of 2014, 2015, that was really when the regulation for banks was being rolled out and our business models were fundamentally being changed. So I joined this internal strategy team with our global equities group. And really, at that point in time, the strategy became a lot about risk management. All these new rules and capital regulation fundamentally changed the business, what, who our competition was. So for me, risk management was more of the decision-making process. At the end, when all the numbers and all the trades are done and it's happening in real time, what are the big decision-makers doing? What, how, do they, how do they actually use decisions? Are they using the models? Are they using the reporting? Or are they kind of going shooting from the hip, doing our experience? I got to see a lot of different, very senior people, how they actually approach decision-making, learned a lot, a lot of unique situations in the market, et cetera. And for me, just really, you know, I had a statistics background that's a huge part of risk management, really fell in love with kind of the practice and the kind of the seat at the table, how you think about decisions and evaluate that decision-making process. So I ended up getting my master's in risk management, really making it in my career and had the opportunity to go into the kind of benefits part of risk management, where we do the modeling, where we do the limits, where we set risk appetite. We do a lot of the kind of traditional processes. And for me, I always really appreciated that opportunity at a very early stage in my career. And really, it was about kind of applying, where do I take this kind of risk management knowledge? And you want to go to somewhere where they're not necessarily thinking about risk yet, which for me was coinciding with kind of private markets overall and technology companies and all these new business models and had some great you know, conversations there and really, really re- realizing that risk management was not something that was always being thought about 
good on the front because there's this kind of success bias around risk. You know, you don't when the going is good, you don't really want to think about what could possibly go wrong. And that, that's certainly uh, a little bit of what's happening in the FTX situation, it seems. Um, but for me, it was really about, hey, how do, I, how do I prove this? How do I prove that risk is not just a have to do, but something you want to do? How can it change your turns? And for me, it was about, you know, doing it for real and getting some skin in the game. So for me, I saw an opportunity with investing where I could bring my risk management skill set to, to prove it out to people and show how it can be a difference for early stage companies and, and private investments in general, where this stuff is not always brought to the forefront of decision making. You know, it's interesting. I mean, I lived in this world for over a decade, as you know, during my time working on the M&A and event-driven trading desk at RBC. So risk-taking was everything we did. It was all that we, was consuming us. But, you know, risk management was really thought of almost like as a compliance department, which it shouldn't be because everyone thinks it's like when you get your slap on the wrist or somebody kind of taps you on the shoulder and says, hey, you know, you're over levered on this position here. You need to unwind that. You never want to have that happen to you, but you do it because you're told to. But when it comes to some of the larger, you know, exposed positions that we obviously saw unravel during the global financial crisis, and when the Vokler rule came in in 2009 and 10, as you started your career, that's when it really started to go from the back office to the front office, where things were really needed to be looked at from a risk management perspective. And you got to grow up in that time period. And we'll obviously get into the FTX situation, how there was fucking no risk management probably at all. I'm sure they use that words, but it's, yeah, I think what it's, it's doing it for real. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I'm sure the analyst who worked on the Credit Suisse desk for two years and then became COO of uh, FTX had a ton of risk management experience. But before we get into that, you know, can you tell us a little bit about your time specifically at Credit Suisse and how the, you know, the banking world evolved from the global financial crisis in 2008 and the things that you witnessed firsthand and how that shaped you till today and the way you think about you know, managing risk and even explaining it to people who don't live in the business every day? Absolutely. So I think you have to take the the historical kind of context of the lead up to the crisis and the appeal of Glass-Steagall and all the different things that kind of happened that led to that, the creation of the products. And anytime there's a crisis, there's a lot of these commonalities with technological change and new products and new structures. And a lot of this stuff repeats and manifests in different ways. Credit Suisse is a very unique place to, to see that because Credit Suisse was one of these banks that was was built through acquisitions. You know, it was a Swiss retail bank that merged with First Boston, which was an American investment bank and trading operation, then bought DLJ, which is obviously a famed uh, investment banking and leveraged finance house. So we really came into with the incredible kind of position of strength. You know, some of the people that came through the firm and built the firm are now leading Blackstone, Blackstone, Millennium. So we had deep connections to the street. And really, when it came to the crisis, we were in an incredibly great position with the strength of our business. We we're the only firm that didn't take money. And that's really why the Credit Suisse story is so interesting, because this was a bank that survived the crisis and actually became number one in a lot of businesses after as people receded. But then over time, obviously, that's changed. And I think for me, what I learned is, you know, Overall, with the markets and what kind of happened over time, there are really a few different key kind of considerations, and, and all of which you know really tie into risk. You know, first was capital. The, the the simple truth with what happened to banks, you know, post crisis was regulation fundamentally changed. You know, from Basel to CCAR, you know, every single central bank realized and, and regulatory actually realized, hey, we need to do more. We need to do more to answer to our constituents. And really what this changes, it changed the strategy, it changed the incentives. And I think for banks, especially banks that were in a position of strength, they wanted to stay strong and they wanted to do what was working. They didn't really appreciate that the market was different, that you couldn't have the same strategy, even if it was successful in the past. And that's a lot of what risk is about, is that kind of approach to capital allocation. You can't just do what, what worked last year is not necessarily going to work in the future. So I think that kind of capital and high regulation change has been huge and, and really how different, you know, regulatory constituencies have said, hey, that if you're a global bank, that's great. But when it comes to your business that is in our our, our country, it's going to be a, a lot different than it was pre-crisis. Another thing was cost. Obviously, there was a huge focus on cost and efficiency. I think I really learned that you can't cost cut your way to greatness. Um, that was something we definitely tried to do because when you start kind of these dynamics with costs and capital, what you really start to do is changing the portfolio and changing the business mix. And the beauty of the investment banking model was that you have a diverse portfolio of businesses that no matter what is kind of happening on the back end, it's going to succeed and, and, and stand the test of time. That's at least what we're trying to do. When you start calibrating a little bit too much on the edges, it really changes a lot of those dynamics overall. 
Yeah. I mean, first off, I actually didn't remember that so many great industry titans came from Credit Suisse, like Steve Schwartzman and Tony James from Blackstone and Larry Fink from BlackRock, you know, Paul Singer, Ken Molis. I mean, there's just so many heavy hitters that came through Credit Suisse. And yeah, good reminder that they were one of the only firms, you know, besides the Canadian banks who didn't take government bailout money, which obviously showed the strength of the platform that was being built at Credit Suisse. But it still feels like the lessons that we came out of the global financial crisis have still never really been embedded into our culture. I mean, given the craziness that we're seeing in the markets today, you know, why do you think it feels like we've never learned from history from a risk management perspective? And why are we still going back into the same, you know, levered assets, but just under a different name? It's, it's, it's people. It's people. I mean, that's where that's the decision making and how this is how this kind of happens. Like these are historical things that happen again and again, because the kind of OS is still humans making decisions like people are going to make mistakes. And I think that if anything, some of the response to the crisis and response to the regulation is really what created these new problems. I and mean, if you really think about what happened to the banking industry, another huge dynamic that I learned is kind of this, you know, market cycles and how that changes, but really like competition. I think the the regulation, the banking really focused on banking sector and these gigantic banks. And they, by doing that and changing regulation, changing capital, what they did is they created all this momentum towards the private markets and also towards hedge funds, you know, a place like Citadel. If you look at Citadel in 2005, six versus now, I mean, they've really someone that's benefited from banks receding back from the trading businesses. A lot more stuff went OTC. And then in terms of kind of asset allocation, asset management overall, you know, private markets, a lot of that had to do with quantitative easing in the Fed. But I think that a lot of times we want, we're, we're very good at solving the previous crisis. And a lot of times we neglect to really think about that forward environment. And that's why from a risk perspective, it's not just about, hey, how do we make sure that way we lost money doesn't happen again? Because you're going to have a lot of unintended consequences when you start doing things. Just because you kind of sector things off and manage that risk doesn't mean new risks aren't Picking up elsewhere. So for for me, it's really about understanding the connection between market cycles and strategy, and you're building for the future and managing the moment. And a lot of times, what a lot of the regulation, a lot of the strategy is, is it's it's fighting last year's war, and and that usually uh, leads to history repeating itself. Yeah, absolutely. If you don't study history, it's inevitable you're going to repeat it. And obviously, we are repeating it in many different ways. But there's also been a lot of black swan type events that have happened over the last decade in this incredible bull market that we've been living in. But people are starting to realize that with a low interest rate environment, there's a huge premium paid for growth. And as soon as that tide turns, the margin for error is very, very small. And things can blow up exponentially before you know it, uh, or even before you can get out of a sticky situation. So, you know, let's talk about today's topic, which is sort of how can startup founders think about risk and how should investors also think about risk when investing in startups or even, you know, private companies in general, thinking about it from their own perspective. So maybe you can give us a little bit of an understanding of like the definition of risk and how it applies itself to the startup mindset. So risk is not a thing. It's a concept. It's a dynamic. And I think that there's always this desire to quantify it and turn it into a number. That's risk measurement. That's not risk management. And and numbers and, and actually doing the hard work and the calculation, that's important, but that's a tool. Really what risk about risk is about is assumptions and expectation. Really trying to understand what do we think will happen? What is that baseline and how much do we deviate from that? You know, what is the spectrum of our it's not so much, hey, here is what our risk is. That's a point in time. That's a number on the page. If you don't understand how it was calculated or what the purpose was, it it's really not it's it's not that useful at all. And that's that, that's kind of the traditional risk and kind of, oh, here's the limit and here's what we do. Well, how did that limit get created? How did this start? A lot of times again, it creates these these unfortunate incentives that end up manifesting in something completely unexpected. So really what risk is about, you know, how I how I think about it is, is volatility and how that kind of plays out over time. How does volatility change with these kind of underlying variables, with the market, with your customers, with the overall operational complexity of your organization, with liquidity, and then obviously adding some randomness. So really, for, when we think about risk, it, it's about that spectrum of options. It's about what's, what's happening and considering that. And if the good news is if you do, you're, you're effectively decreasing your risk because it's no longer this unknown. So for, for companies, for startups, uh, especially, you know, there's a lot of really tangible things you do, you can start by listing your risks. And really, that's a conversation you have with yourself. That's a conversation you have with your co-founders, even with your, your customers, with your investors, but really starting to kind of conceptualize, like, 
like, what is the spectrum of outcomes that can happen for us? Because you don't want to just plan for one path. You want to kind of look overall. And the same with investors, you know, t- stress testing your portfolio. What happens if some of these investments go to zero, et cetera? And, that, and that's not meant to scare, but it's meant to just give that context and having kind of a healthy relationship with risk. To me, the biggest thing about risk that, that is a, the misconception is it's a lot about communication. When I think about some of the big risk challenges that, that firms have had and, and companies, you know, you can see in the headlines, you know, I've been involved with some, some pretty high profile situations as a, a Credit Suisse, and really it boils down to communication or a lack of that. That's what leads to this. It's, it's, it's someone, someone over here knows what's happening, but someone, <laughs> the people at the top don't really appreciate them. And that, that culture of communication and getting, you know, talking about risk in a healthy way, having a healthy relationship with it. I think that that's, that's really what it's about for, for founders and investors and, and really acknowledging what risks are we taking? Let's be real. <laughs> Let's be real about it. If you're, if, you're, if you're an early stage founder or early stage investor, you're in the business of taking risks. The goal is not risk elimination. You should you should go into something else. Um, but it's really being real about what can happen. And, and over time, initially a little uncomfortable maybe to think about stuff like that. But if you can create an environment where there can be a healthy dialogue, uh, it's incredibly empowering because it's no longer the scary thing and it's the the fears uh, that, that you know make it tough to sleep at night. But you're considering it. And you can, when you have have that kind of context, you know, those are data points. What someone, what your investor says your risks are, that's a data point about them and their incentives. So once you kind of understand risks, you start to underline, understand the underlying dynamics, you can start to have that kind of productive dialogue and how you actually manage them in your business model. I mean, that is a perfect explanation of things that people are too scared to do, but they shouldn't be. And by having a healthy relationship with risk, exactly like you said, is not just ignoring it or accepting it. It's that you acknowledge it and you build scenario planning around it. So what we tell our companies at Ripple is create scenario A, B, and C. You know, don't optimize for only A. Obviously, that's the one you want to have outcome, but have planning for scenario B and C, which are worst case scenarios, just in case things start to not work out in your favor, because hope is not a plan. And obviously, we see as the numbers get bigger and the, the risk profile becomes stronger, a lot of people just bury their head in the sand. For example, SBF, that fucking guy came out with an apology that said, I should have paid more attention to this. Well, Obviously, you should have paid more attention to it. It was the biggest risk in your business and you were not paying attention to it. So maybe you can give us sort of the psychology that you've witnessed when people say, I should have paid more attention to it, that early stage founders should think about starting off the right way from a culture perspective and from a strategy perspective, how to sit down and list out their risks and address them or just acknowledge them from a healthy point of view from the beginning. So there's an important delineation to make here, and that's the proactive element of risk management and the reactive management aspect of risk management. A lot of times the reactive element is where the real issues manifest. It's very, very rare for there to be one thing happens and then there's a blow up. And what I've seen, it's something bad happens and then a bad decision is made again and then another bad decision gets someone off balance and they have short termism and, and then they make an even worse decision. And that's really, I mean, there's a lot that's coming out about this situation, but but what we can already see is that there was a lot of bad decisions made in succession and worse and worse decisions to try to fix the original decision. And so the reactive element of risk management, that's the toughest part because that's again, you know, when the when the shit hits the fan, so to speak. Do you run to your risk reports and look at last month's reporting? Of course not, right? But so much time gets spent on preparing them and doing all that type of stuff. It's not really, again, that that healthy relationship with it where it's it's that taking the step back. So I think the reactive part of it is like you always have to stay on your best, your, your own team, you know, stay stay tied into, hey, what are we actually trying to accomplish here? And, and take that step back and not get caught up in that moment. And that's where like the proactive part is so important. That's why you do scenario planning so that when you get in one of those tail scenarios, when you get into that, wow, this had a 2% chance of happening, but now it's happening what do you do? And I think we can kind of do some you know, probability about that. You know, it's, it's like throwing a pair of dice, you know, playing a, playing a dice game. When you step up, you know, there's a one in 36 chance it's going to be snake eyes. What actually, what actually happens when you roll that snake eyes? Um, if it means you walk away from the table and never play the game again, that's a risk you weren't willing to take. And a lot of times that's kind of people forget that part of probability and, and you know, even 
or an institutional level, concepts like VAR, you know, value at risk. Um, when you put those numbers in front of business leaders and their VAR would be five or six million. And then there will be a loss of over, you know, that number. They're like, oh my gosh, how could this happen? It's like, that's not what that metric is designed to do. When you're taking risk, you have to expect loss. Expected value is kind of how I, how I phrase it, you know, for fintechs. You have to, if you're putting risk out there, you can't just say, hey, this is what our this is what our return is going to be. You have to, to haircut that for what risk are you actually taking and, and expect there to be loss every month. And I think that a lot of times people don't, again, they don't think about, they don't want to think about the thing, what can go wrong. And so when the, when it actually starts going wrong and they've never thought about what can happen, that, they make poor decisions. And, and that's really why it's about having these conversations on the front end. Thinking about it on a, on a monthly basis, you know, what can companies do for, you know, you think about your risks and what they are, review it every quarter. You know, that's something, you know, have that quarterly meeting and, and have it in a healthy dialogue and, and think about the probabilities. What are the new things? that are, What was something that we were worried about that we aren't really worried about anymore? And how being able to do that kind of proactive element of risk management so that when you are reactive, you're turning to something that's a little sturdier than numbers from last month. Yeah, I mean, the saying where there's smoke, there's fire is not something that you just pass by lightly. It usually proves itself to be true. And it's obviously proven itself to be true with the FTX situation. There was probably one small bad decision after another and tried to recover, but got himself deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole. And eventually it was just way too big to untangle. You know, it's sometimes when we see our early stage founders send out their monthly updates and it's all roses, it's all positive. They're so excited about everything. And that's when I get actually really upset because I'm like, there's got to be risk here that you're just not willing to talk about or you're not understanding or willing to share. So I respond to the founder and say, hey, look, what are you worried about? What keeps you up at night? What do you need help with? And what risk are you seeing in the short term and the long term that you're trying to at least acknowledge and maybe address? And that's something I think people, as you say, need to have a healthier relationship with. And, and I think one, yeah, absolutely. And I think I take that a little bit further. Some advice I got early on from an operational uh, risk expert was it's not what keeps you up at night. It's how well do you sleep at night? Because if you're in the business of risk, there's always going to be stuff that can happen. But the whole point is, again, you're thinking about it. You're considering that it's a possibility. You're not hiding away. You're not hiding from it, but you're really embracing that. And, and that would be part of my you know, general advice, especially in these kind of contorting, changing markets, is to embrace that uncertainty. Um, it's very easy to get caught up in the mania and, oh, my God. This is what someone was asking for a month ago, and their their expectations have completely changed. And oh, the markets are going down. It's really easy to get up in that. You have to embrace that uncertainty. Be on your own team and realize that this is markets. This is finance. Uh, yesterday's price is not today's price. You, you, you spent a lot of time on the trading floor, like me. The, the price lasts for minutes, right? The changes that fast. You can't kind of count on that. And I think that that's where people's expectations and and their assumptions. And I would, would kind of. Put, start talking about assumptions a little bit again in terms of looking at financial models. You mentioned these monthly updates. A lot of times when I look at models, there's there's hard numbers in there. Really, you know, open, I would encourage founders and you know, investors who are reviewing you know uh, balance sheets alike to to look at what are the really challenge. What are the variables in this business? Mean? What what are the drivers of it? What are the th- you know, customer growth, pricing, et cetera, you know, default rate, loss rate? Like what are the 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 variables that we're that are what are the numbers that are variables that we're treating like constants, that we're treating like assumptions? And so really again, I always go back to you know, risk is not the enemy, it's assumptions and it's expectations. Those are the things that can really change how you're incentivized, change how you're thinking about things. And again, take you down a path that you never expected to walk in the first place. Yeah. I mean, so many people take assumptions as matter of fact points that should not be taken for, for uh, serious hard numbers. And we do that uh, subconsciously all the time when assessing risk. And, and that's a really bad thing. We take a pitch deck as, you know, as gospel or audited financial statements when we know they shouldn't be until you've gone through the due diligence process. So maybe given your time as an angel investor, you've invested a lot uh, as well in the public and private markets. You know, what are some classic risks that you've seen or that you've uncovered as an early stage uh, investor that other founders should be aware of that maybe other investors won't cover as where that they should be addressing? Yeah, I think I think there's obviously a range of this. We, I like to break risk down in these kind of traditional categories of market risk. A lot of times people don't really think about, you know, the connection between market risk and credit risk and operational risk, these kind of dynamics that go through and, and liquidity risk. It's not so much anything in a in a vacuum, but but a lot of times people will think they're solving for something, but not realizing the impacts that has on the place. You know, go to market is a great example of that. 
your go-to-market, especially for fintechs, is going to impact what your portfolio is. The type of customers that you're going after, that's going to lead to your credit risk. Your, your customers are your, your risk. That is what is bringing risk into the platform. And the type of market that you, you target, that's going to inform how uh, resilient your operations need to be. How many customers are you going to be using them? So a lot of times what I see is, is, is a lot of focus on a very you know, solving something very specific and not always thinking, okay, well, if you change that and you take that approach, what are these second order things that have second order implications that really lead to some of these challenges? Um, I think, you know, right now, obviously a lot of focus on burn, a lot of focus on like how much burn do we, should we wish our burn be at? How many months of runway do we need to be at? And there's obviously a lot of companies that were optimizing for different things and we're keeping tight burn. And as, again, an assumption about a fundraising backdrop that is not coming to fruition, but also, you know, there's no right answer on the amount of burn. Nobody knows. That's it. That's, that's kind of the point. I would I'd prefer much more to think about it as not so much, you know, what is our burn? You know, we've heard, you know, 24, you need 22 years of burn, 24 months of burn. One thing I know is that in six months, those same people aren't going to be saying you need 18 months of burn. You know, these are these are moving targets. So I wouldn't really think about burn and how much burn do I need? I think about, hey, how much how much do we need to prove our concept? Like it really it hasn't changed what the goal is, which is getting to default to life. You know, how much do we need to get to that point and again have some flexibility? I would much rather people look at, hey, how much Take take three to six months and put it in a bucket. You know, put that put that away. Don't consider that part of your strategy. Give yourself that. I much prefer a conversation about reserves, and I think you know investors should think about that as well, especially when they're looking at companies. You know, how much do they have is going to be big. And then I think another one is really you know terms. I think that that's going to be something that really comes to the forefront in this environment is these trade offs between valuations and terms and you know paper that really had a profound um, impact on, on how I think of private markets is squaring venture. Uh, capital valuation with reality. Uh, Stanford professor and this guy, Will Gornell, wrote it. And it really dug into the secondary market in the paper and how the terms of that, that time of those vintages that were raised in 2009, 2011, IPO ratchets, liquidation preferences, et cetera, that has, you can calculate the impact that has on valuation. And I see a lot of times, you know, what's being announced publicly, I, you know, having, having seen these previous, you know, what is, what has happened, there's going to be this urge to preserve valuation or to get access to a certain amount of cup, a certain amount of capital. And I really encourage, you know, founders to consider how if you sign up for three X liquidation preference, like that changes your calculus, you know, and it's great to print and maintain evaluation, et cetera. But I would really challenge you to take more dilution or take a low a down round before you start signing up to things that are going to have a multi-year forward impact. And then for investors, you know, to think about that the same way, um, you can uh, <laughs> surgery can be a success and the patient dies. Right. And I think a lot of times investors are focused on preserving their capital for their LPs. And again, that's new. a lot of times, you know, risk is not about people are doing bad things like definitely happens, you know, but again, that's usually our pattern of decision making. A lot of times everyone is acting how they're incentivized. And so really tying that in and, and for investors, you know, really question, why, why are you in this game? Or if you're an angel investor and all of a sudden you've been writing checks and then you're, you're asking for weekly updates, like really challenge, like, why are you doing, that? you know, where were you, you know, before? And also what is the real risk? I mean, if you're stepping into an angel investing environment and expecting, you know, X amount to be successful, like, you're going to you're going to get challenged on that especially in times like this. Yeah, I mean it's a perfect uh comparison to sort of how people need to be willing to compromise on risk and do it intentionally and not just saying, well, it's what I need best for my model and this is only important to me and fuck everyone else because there's other risks that you're now basically uncovering or forcing to the head because of what you're kind of taking a hard line on. So for example, if you're an investor, uh, let's say, and you're trying to put a term sheet together and you're putting all these different things in like liquidity preference and ratchets and all that stuff and board oversight and sign off, the biggest risk you're now putting up in front of the founder is founder flight. The founder's going to leave. He doesn't want to deal with this anymore, even though they signed the deal and you're like, great. So I'm holding onto an asset that has no leadership because I was so uh, adamant about holding onto my liquidation preference or some sort of preference just for you as the investor. But you just ignored all the other risks that are now coming to a head. That's exactly it. Those changes in that strategy, like the things you do now because you think you're solving for X. The implications of that, you know, over time, you know, look to history like this has happened before. Like people, again, will leave those companies. It's not going to manifest right away or else you failed with the term sheet. It's going to manifest in two years when times get good and that founder realizes, 
why am I working so hard to make sure this guy gets paid and me and all my people, you know, it's a different calculus. So I think that really, again, it's that connection between market cycles and business strategy. Um, again, something that I learned by being in a dynamic markets environment. And we have to really realize that the crazy times are now, but really the crazy times was 2010 to 2012 when a quantitative using an unprecedented money stimulus came to the system, created that premium growth that you're talking about. As interest rates have tripled, quadrupled in some cases, you know, depending on where, the calculus has changed. That premium on growth has changed. So, you know, investing models that are predicated on that, you know, that are delivering returns that people were talking about years ago, like that expectation has to change, you know, expectations for founders on valuation. What is a series A? It's not, you know, what do you do a series A if you did raise a hundred million dollar seed round, right? Like some of these things that have been done in the past, like it's about getting kind of forward through that and realizing that times have changed because of interest rates, that's finance, that's dynamic markets. It doesn't, you know, get over the, it may seem unfair. I mean, I've definitely heard that from some people where it's like, wow, these, you know, this was my expectation. You know, this is what this investor talked about and they did no diligence. And now they're, they're calling me all the time and stuff like stuff like that. And like, really like you have to embrace that. That's part of the process. Everyone's trying to do their job, but that's why it's like, it's having that healthy, that healthy relationship with like, what can go wrong? What is happening and not making it something that you never get out there. You never talk about with your team. You never talk about with your investors um, and really kind of embracing that forward path. What, what is again, that future that we're building for and we're really managing where we are right now with respect to that. Right. It's like you said, not just taking risk, but taking risk intentionally and understanding, you know, the pros and cons on why you're asking for what you're asking. Now, you've also gone, like I mentioned, into the private investing world, and we're lucky to have you as an LP in our funds. But, you know, can you share a little bit about how you went from a mindset perspective from the public markets to the private investing world and how you were thinking about adjusting your risk curve to accept the obvious, you know, increased risk in private companies with the lack of visibility versus some of the private, you know, company reporting you can get so sort of comfortable with the risk you see there? Fun, fundamentally different. With with private markets, it's you don't have the information. You can't open up a Bloomberg terminal. You can't open up a 10K, 10Q. So it's really relationship driven. I think that that's been one of my big takeaways. I looked at secondary markets and trying to make investments that way. But for me, I really realized that that information asymmetry really makes information and relationships paramount. So I started my private investment journey by investing in friends. Uh, my very first private investment was an ice cream shop in South Carolina. And just going through that process, you know, having that relationship, pre-existing relationship, the founder getting comfortable about that, but also like learning what that process is like. And I invested in a friend who started a family office down in Australia. And that relationship led to a relationship with you. Uh, he, uh, Gavin and, and Jonathan uh, introduced us and and obviously, you know, becoming an Alpine fan, I've learned a lot. So a lot of what, you know, private investing is about relationships, but also learning something. You know, I think the beauty with a, a private investment is that you get that different type of information. You get that direct connection. You're talking to the guy who's managing money. You're talking to the CEO. You invest in Apple, you don't get to talk to Tim Cook. <laughs> you don't get to learn directly from them. And so I think a lot of, especially getting out, a lot of the benefit is, is getting the experience, understanding that, and, and really getting something from it. As an early stage investor, especially an angel investor, if you're running for pure monetary reasons, like you're better off playing the public markets, like build a model, do a basket of options in that way. Angel investors, like you're taking a lot of risk again, acknowledging the risk that you're taking, and you want to get some benefit in some way, and that's right there in the name, because you are an investor in the company. It's something you believe in. I mean, that's something that really, I will see great business ideas, but if it's not something that, that I think will be potentially possible, but as an angel investor, when it's my own capital, I want to be investing in things that I want to want to see succeed and not just because there's a return. And I want to invest in people that, that I want to see succeed that I think are approaching things the right way. So it, it takes a little more due diligence. It takes a little more time. Um, in terms of thinking about things, but but for me, it's it's really about that. And then when you think about kind of portfolio construction, I think the way I've approached it is the, the LP interest and in investing in funds. You want to invest in experts like yourself. For me, I learned a lot from that. But that's also kind of my market beta, so to speak. And then I really view angel investments as that kind of single stock options on top of that, where these are these are potential things and you know, these are high conviction trades. But really managing your risk down. I think part of the the benefit in the current private investing market is that it's not it doesn't have to be a $50,000 check, $100,000 check, like traditional angel investing was. There's there's SPVs now, there's angel
Angelus and you have this opportunity to, for even a few thousand dollars, get involved with some of these companies, learn, try to bring value to their, try to kind of stand out because ultimately, you know, these are long roads to actually see a liquidity event, you know, that aren't, you know, near term acquisitions. So you're going to have to have some type of relationship. Really what you want is to, to get the opportunity to look at those follow ons and those other offers. And that, and that takes kind of, again, it always starts with that relationship. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I had to learn the same journey that you did that your network can benefit, but also, you know, uh, receive benefit from the network that you just joined when you invest in a uh, startup or a fund. Uh, and so you can take advantage of that. But also, like you said, you can't change the outcome of Coca-Cola. They're going to report every quarter. They're going to do what they want to do. And you as a silent shareholder is along for the ride. And if you're not okay with that, and you want to take it a, a little bit of a step further and have impact on potentially the outcome of your investment, then the private market ecosystem is something that you may want to take a step into. But doing it from a, a risk-adjusted basis and understanding there's a lot of uh, lack of visibility and control, but also the ability to influence sometimes the outcomes uh, are the pros and cons of, of doing that in the private side. Uh, but how do you add value as a private investor? You know, I know personally how I've gotten value from you as an LP in our fund, but maybe share for our listeners how you think about adding value to the other private investments you make. By where you have expertise. I mean, I've been very fortunate to have a breadth of expertise in, in finance, investment banking, capital markets, strategy, risk management. And really, it's about understanding the company and, and trying to see, like, what do they need? What you're, you're, you're approaching. You're not a consultant as an angel investor. You're not just going to have, here's how I do Here's how I interact with founders. Here's how I do it. You want to do it on their terms. They have plenty of things they're trying to manage. So for some companies, yeah, it is about you know making introductions, trying to help them with strategy, trying to help them with risk management. But that's got to be a two-way street. That's got to be something they're interested in. So it's really depends on the founder, depends on the company and how that changes over time. There's been companies that are very active initially, and then that changes and, and vice versa. So it's really, as an investor, you want to always keep the context. You want to keep the perspective. You want to keep them on the right track, in my mind. And, and, and try to be proactive about that. Um, it's also just st simple stuff. Picking up the phone. If they ask for an introduction, actually delivering that. It's easy to say, you know, hey, absolutely, you know, my network, anyone you want to intro to, but actually doing that, actually carrying, carrying through with that. Also getting past the seed round, that initial fundraising, once that kind of excitement has died down, you know, again, reaching out proactively is something you've talked about, you know, get, grabbing coffee, but also having a call, seeing how things are going um, as a person to person. These are, again, personal relationships. These aren't, these aren't corporations, um, you know, they, they are, but they're, they're getting on that path. So I think in terms of adding value, you definitely want to offer your professional expertise. And I think that that's the exciting thing about angel investing for everyone is, you know, for example, doctors, you know, investing in a, in a healthcare company, you have a lot to potentially add there. Same with lawyers, you know, or, you know, have someone who can, can look over a document, you know, or people who are in sales, uh, when they angel invest, they're able to give advice on that. So you want to kind of bring your domain expertise, make sure the founders always realize that's available to them, but really make sure you're doing it on their terms because the last thing you want is you spending a bunch of time trying to tell someone something and they're just trying to listen to appease you. You never want to kind of have that. So I really think you got to, you got to, again, have that relationship. Know what is this, how can I benefit this person, but also make sure you're doing it on their terms because as a founder, you got a lot of different people that are, that are giving you advice. And so I would, you know, turn that the other way as a founder, you want to get that advice, but everyone's a data point. You know, everyone's got their own incentives. And I would really say, you know, that's where skin in the game comes in. Um, it's great to talk to people and get have conversations. But when someone has skin in the game, it, that, that's the only way to really get incentives aligned. I completely agree. When a lot of people are in corporate jobs at lawyers, accounting firms, consultings, they always say, how do I get involved with startups? Or how do I get some of these startups uh, to get me on as an advisor? Or will compensate me with equity? I'm like, well, that makes no freaking sense. You know, like you're already asking for something before giving anything. So first off, give before you ask in any situation. And then if you can put some skin in the game, buy some equity in the business and then offer advice. And then that will pay off, you know, 10 times more than you just asking for something right off the bat. Right. For, for you, put skin in the game for you, not for them. Right. It's very easy to have a conversation and give a bunch of advice when you've got nothing to lose and nothing to gain. It's, it's not going to be genuine. When you have that skin in the game, it really makes sure that your incentives are aligned with the um, so, so I completely agree with that. The change the dynamic, and that's where really my why I became an angel investor, and why I, as a mechanism for risk management, because it was, hey, I want to be alongside as well. Like it's just giving advice is is just advice. It's again, it's data points. But when it comes from someone who's on this again same side of the table as you, it, it's a lot different, and you also get to see the founder's perspective. 
100 percent. Well, you took your public market expertise on the risk management side and combined it with your private angel investing uh, side career and decided to actually leave the public side of the world and join a stealth startup called Tola recently. So can you share a little bit about why you decided to give uh, startups a try and how do you decide to eventually leave Credit Suisse and then join a company while assessing the risk of joining a startup like Tola? I mean, from my standpoint, um, it wasn't, wasn't as risky as it was for some, um, but I definitely never thought I would leave a 40,000 person organization to go to a company without a customer. But for me, this is something I was building towards. This is not something that happened kind of overnight. It was something that over time, and, and really the opportunity with Tola was was too good to pass up from, from a variety of reasons. One, you know, I just started as an investor in the company. I just started as an angel investor in the company. So from a business model and what they were doing, I always it really resonated with me, I think that you know one of the big differences was got to, you know one of the, the, the founders, Alan and Guillaume, you know when I talked to them about risk management, here's what I bring to the table with regards to risk. They're really interested, and one conversation became a couple more, and eventually it kind of naturally progressed into, hey, would you consider doing this full time? And and as and as an angel investor, hey, this was the ultimate skin in the game moment for me. Put my money where my mouth is moment. You know, vote with your feet, whatever analogy or, or, or term you want to use. For me, it was really this is the next level to prove it, and it takes you know really the right people, the team. Once I met the team, it was a very easy decision. You know, a great group of people. Globally, remote, we're a remote organization, and really, you know, the mission and what we're trying to accomplish was a was a culmination of a lot of things that have been building towards you know bringing risk management to places where it isn't necessarily. So, Tola, we're a cash flow optimization uh, platform for small businesses, so startups, yes, but really you know, even retail, e-commerce, um, and really what that means for us is is pay and get paid, and then doing embedded financing alongside them. So, a lot of small businesses, you know, normally. They owe someone money and someone owes them money. There's this kind of mismatch with capital and cash. And, and again, that puts people in these positions where they make challenging decisions with regards to credit card spend and taking on very, very <laughs> tough terms on loans. And really what we're trying to do is, is embed ourselves alongside them. You have a platform for them to, to operate their business, but then provide that support, that cash flow kind of management through supply chain fan, financing, through factoring. And really, for me, that gives the opportunity to underwrite small businesses to look at it as an overall sector and find a way to bring more and more capital to support the growth of these businesses and building their resiliency over time. So how have you added value besides from the risk perspective and obviously as an angel investor now that you've been a part of the of the company's journey as an operator? Absolutely. So I think it's it's really about what can we take from these institutional risk management approaches? What does it actually mean to the early stage? How do we think about putting together our list of risks? How do we think about our financial model, about our projections, how we think about what are the assumptions in here. So I think I've been able to bring a lot in terms of how do we do, you know, we know what we want eventually in terms of structure, but what does that actually mean and making it tangible? Um, how do we think about products, how we think about go to market using kind of what I know with markets overall, and then the actual risk expertise with regards to underwriting. When we have the opportunity to have data on a small business, what numbers do we care about? How do we think about risk with related to them? How do we think about balances and volatility? And what is the appropriate level to underwrite them, not only on an individual basis, but at a portfolio level? Because ultimately for us, again, about attracting more capital to this part of the market, our underwriting is going to be what different providers and partners care about. So really trying to lead with risk management, make sure it's not a it's a have to do type thing, but really it's fundamental and inter- entwined with the strategy. And that's why this business was so perfect for, for me, because risk is so fundamental to what we're doing at a customer by customer basis, but also at a platform basis. Well, it's super exciting. I'm so happy to have you finally join the startup world and ecosystem as an operator after leaving, you know, the ivory towers like I did working on Wall Street to take uh, your you know, shot at rolling up your sleeves and building something that people really love and are passionate about. You know, I, I find that risk is something that people kind of think about as the elephant in the room. Uh, and my, my father-in-law always says, how do you eat an elephant? Well, one bite at a time. And that's kind of like how you should think about risk, right? You don't have to just list it all on a whiteboard and say, well, there it is. And, you know, go back to your day job. Good luck with everything, people. Uh, it's really accepting or first acknowledging it, understanding how they could kill you or create you. And then going through each piece one bite at a time uh, is how people should really think about risk. You know, I want to ask you before we jump into our final section here, you know, what were some of the biggest lessons you've learned over your time in the risk world that you've heard from other people that you still live with today about risk and about sort of life in general? 
I mean, there, there, there's, there's a lot. I think communication, you know, in general, I think a lot of what I learned was just seeing how people make decisions because you can't always, what someone else does in a specific moment, it's hard to always extrapolate that into, hey, here's the, 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 the fail-safe thing. I think that for me, a lot of the benefit was who I got to work with. I mean, that's why Credit Suisse was such an incredible place. But a lot of the people I got to work with, the senior risk managers, they were ex-traders. So to think, see how different people made different decisions. I worked for five different chief risk officers for, for equities and all of them were, had trading backgrounds, but all of them did things a little bit differently. So I think not a, not a very, I would love to, to just kind of summarize it, but I think that really for me, it's, it's, it's using every kind of one of these situations, every, everything is an opportunity to learn more. For when it comes to risk, it's again, it's about communication. It's about expectations. And when the pressure is on not acting impulsively and sol- you know, trying to solve one very specific thing, but always keeping that context and you know, doing the work, doing the math, right? And realizing that that's kind of a table stakes for, for getting in these type of businesses. You have to do that, but they will ultimately like, it's just a tool, you know, again, risk measurement versus risk management. I think that that would be a huge delineation to make. Um, and one way to kind of, I would say, finish on that is, is really that, that risk again, for these kind of ex traders, you know, people who have a lot of success, Risk is not a have to do. They're in the business of risk. It's a strategic differentiator. It's what they care about. And I think for startups, that's how that's how to view it. You know, something like a KYC or a KYB program, you're not doing that because your bank banking partner requires it. You want to do that because that's going to change your bottom line. That's going to change who you're dealing with. It's a strategic, it's a part of you, you want to do it because it's going to really benefit you. Same with go to market and thinking about risk. Like these are things that you want to think about what your portfolio is going to look like if you're successful or if you're not. And, and it's not something that again, you have to do. You have to have this compliance level of things. Like a lot of times that's where the big delineation is. And, and another lesson, I guess, uh, in a roundabout way would be Really, there's 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 knowledge behind why this stuff, the policies, the processes, the limits, there's knowledge behind why that exists. And it's really when it comes to risk, those traditional approaches, models, et cetera, it's about knowing how to apply them. That's the biggest part. If you're just doing it because you have to, you're going to waste a lot of other people's time. You're going to waste a lot of your own time. You're going to waste a lot of money. It's really the why do you do it, understanding that um, that, that, I, that I've carried forward. Yeah, you know, one of the best movies that I think encapsulates risk measurement and risk management and overall risk taking is uh, Free Solo with Alex Honnold. I mean, everyone would look at that and be like, that's the riskiest fucking thing you can do in your life, climbing, you know, El Cap with no ropes. But to him, you know, the way he explains it, it is a full on risk measurement and management. You know, he thinks about every single aspect of what could go wrong and addresses the situation and, and does it what he does, which is makes him, you know, the greatest free climber, free solo climber in the world. It's it's so perfect, Matt. And we, we've never talked about this, but I actually went to a screening of that movie and he did q and I asked him a question about risk in there. And to him, <laughs> his answer was effectively like, to me, it's not risk. Right. And I think that that's, again, that's why it's like, it's so everyone wants to just have an answer and have a framework, but that's why it's really about having that healthy relationship through us. One person or something that's risky to some person is not risky to another. And it's really that, that dynamic. And, and he's a, he's, he's a fantastic risk manager, um, at least for now. Yeah, exactly. Uh, before we jump into our fast favorites, I got to ask you your quick take. What do you think happens with SPF and FTX? And what do you think we see come out of this from like the next 10, 20 years? Having been in situations, you know, what's happening internally versus publicly, like I don't want to rush to to judgments. I am ascribed to the kind of man in the arena dynamic. All those caveats aside, like this situation looks really bad. Um, everyone's kind of trying to paint, uh, is it Enron? Is it Theranos? Is it is it Lehman? I mean, to me, there's a lot of made off in it for sure. But the, the one that I keep going back to is bringing down the house. The, the story about the MIT students who went to Vegas and were counting cards. There is a dynamic of very smart people who were making really bad decisions, but because they're getting away from it, it got bigger and bigger. So overall, you look at the balance sheet, you look at some of the stuff that's coming out, there's a high level of incompetence with regards to this. So I think that there's going to be a lot of changes um, on the back. I think how crypto is being advertised, I would expect that to be a place where the, the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau look, takes a hard look at what type of Super Bowl ads will be allowed. But I also think that just, you know, from the investment community, hey, this was a this is a pretty significant one. This is something we're going to be looking at for many years. To me, the bigger thing about this is this is now, you know, the second time in a couple of years that a technology infused trading platform has gone through a massive overnight liquidity crisis. Obviously, Robinhood, GameStop, the other one. And I think it's going to be very interesting from a history standpoint to look at like Robinhood and their partners and why they 
they, they, why they survived and how, you know, some of the good things they did, you know, for the bad things. Um, and then FTX. But I think, I think that, Hey, these, these type of situations, this is going to be something, you know, in a few years, there'll be a, you know, a Netflix or Hulu series about him. I, I just don't know who's going to play him yet. It's going to be Jonah Hill, and I'm sure he's sharpening his pencils and studying a lot of different YouTube clips on this guy. So thank you for sharing your thoughts on it. Before we wrap things up, we always ask our guests for their fast favorites. So first off, your favorite podcast. I got a big fan of history, uh, Revolutions, Mike Duncan. He goes through a, a variety of, of previous things. You know, French Revolution 1, Season 3 is my favorite. Incredible listen. Listen to it a few times. Love uh, Revolutions podcast. That's a good suggestion. Next is your favorite newsletter or blog. I've been a huge fan of Matt Levine's uh, money stuff at Bloomberg for a long time. I've been following him since he was on Deal Breaker. It's pretty incredible. You know, he's someone who's taken an interesting path to being a writer, being an ex lawyer, being an ex Goldman uh, convert trader. So that's must read for for anyone interested in finance, even just generally. And and he's a pretty creative writer as well. Yeah, he's definitely going to win a Pulitzer on probably this FTX saga when he's all done with it. Favorite tech gadget? I have a drone, a DJI a Mavic. A, Absolutely love it. Something that actually then came uh, became a little bit of something I use a little bit more. Um, I'm on the board of San Francisco Baykeeper, and we do a lot of pollution investigation. We lost uh, our drone pallet, so I've actually had to step up and put my drone to the test. When we were covering the kind of algae bloom, I, I got the I got the bat signal, so I got to actually uh, it became more of a hobby and kind of became a part of what I was doing for the Baykeepers. Wow, getting called into battle—that's pretty cool. I like to hear that. Always available for that call. <laughs> Okay. Favorite new trend? For me, it's digital yoga. I mean, I, w- I got into yoga after I had a big uh, challenge with my back a-, a few years back and, you know, pandemic hit and it really changed how, how, it, how it happens. But now there's a lot of teachers out there, you know, mine, Allison Smith's doing an incredible job with that. So I just love the idea that I can hop into a class kind of wherever, wherever I am, whatever time. So I, I think that this kind of digital fitness maybe in general would be uh, the trend that I would point to um, and, and for sure. That's a good one. I think that one's going to be one of the ones that carries through um, after you know the pandemic is all finished and done, uh, that a lot of people are going to be happy that they got into. So uh, good luck to Peloton out there. Favorite book? I'd have to say uh, Andrew Roberts' Napoleon book. That's someone that I've come back to a couple of times. Um, lot, could, could do a separate podcast on that uh, alone, but that, that's an incredible book. And for pe- that time period, you know, when democracy was really kind of being coming into the forefront of across countries, like such a fascinating time and, and it, it's a story that uh, I think is, is pretty incredible. So both your podcast and your book are on the French Revolution. And hey, there's a lot of history. There's a lot of history books over there. Like hey, that's part of risk management. I mean, when you're a ri- when you're a risk 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 is you know history is is a huge part of that. You're a historian in some ways. So I definitely try to you know take time, you know bully pulpit about Teddy Roosevelt and 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 William Howard Taft is another great one again media and a lot of times like history you know repeats you know i think it more it's about it rhymes and you can learn a lot from these kind of periods of profound change which i think we're living in internet digitization it's changed everything i think in 100 years someone's gonna look back and be like what a fascinating time totally Uh, i absolutely repeats itself in rhymes uh and last but not least your favorite life lesson I'd say don't take anyone else's path to success. Um, that's been a huge one for me. Different way to say, you know, be yourself, embrace the journey. But but that for me has been something that's really carried and allowed me to make moves that to some people seem unconventional. But to me, you know, I, I really love the path I'm on and, and have a lot of appreciation for the opportunities. That's fantastic. Well, thanks for joining us so much in the tank today with Evan Dreyer, Head of Risk at TOLA. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for listening to another episode of Tank Talks. To learn more about this episode, be sure to go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify to find more detailed notes on this episode or to check out previous episodes. Also, if you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review and a rating as it helps us out a lot. And hit that subscribe button so you can get notified when new episodes come out. Finally, make sure to give me a follow on Twitter at Matty B. Cohen or at Tank Talk Podcast to stay up to date on new episodes or to be a guest on our show. Till next time, 